Welcome to worship as we gather as God's people in his house today. And we especially welcome you if you're here as a guest with us. I pray that in this place you will receive our welcome and the welcome of the God we worship. Today is a special day for a number of reasons. For one, we are welcoming the Dort Concert Choir with us who will be leading us in worship from the beginning towards the end. And we celebrate the gift of music and with that the ability to praise our Lord well today. Also today we will be doing our commissioning of Sunday school teachers and gyms and cadets and young people's leaders, those who will be the point people discipling our youth in this coming school year. And we're going to commission them today and send them with our blessing to do their work as we begin Sunday school this Sunday after the service. One other just announcement for those who are members at Bethel. This is the last full week we'll have this survey open for Healthy Church. We had a little over 200 respondents. We'd really like to get to 275. And so if you have taken it, but you have a spouse who hasn't, or if you've got a friend or a sibling who hasn't, or an uncle or an aunt, try to, you know, bug them this week um, and see if you can get them to take that. If we get 275, we're going to reward us as a congregation. We figure for a healthy church, we should have a healthy reward. So we're going to have donut holes if we get to 275. And so if you've taken it, but someone you know hasn't, encourage them this week to take that survey so we can hear together well what God is doing. And with that, let's open this service praying together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, in a world that is so filled with violence, we thank you for your invitation today to a kingdom that is marked by peace. In a world that is so often marked with hatred, we thank you for your invitation to enter into your family that is marked by love. Father, in a world where everyone is for themselves, we thank you for a Savior who died that everyone in him may live. This kingdom, this family, this Savior you've called us to is so different than the world we've lived this week. And so we pray that we would enter into this story, that we'd enter into your presence. And Heavenly Father, that you would draw from us true praise today as we celebrate your goodness to us through Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? We have many reasons to praise, and the psalmist calls us to do that in the words of Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord, I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. The psalmist calls us to praise even though we realize God's works and thoughts are beyond us. And our opening song does that. O God, beyond all praising. And as we sing, the choir will enter.
I know what it's like singing behind students where you guys sit. (laughs) Friends, we gather in God's presence and he's the one who greets us with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. As God's people gathered in his presence, would you please turn and greet those around you with the love and peace of Jesus Christ. Friends, you may be seated, and the choir will lead us now singing praise to the Lord. songs were songs that called us to praise, but now God gives us another word to speak, and that is a word of confession. Hear this invitation to open our hearts to God from James chapter 4. Friends, submit yourselves then to God. 
Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. God calls us to come near to him and promises he will come near to us. And we do that in confession as the choir sings as a prayer of confession, nearer, still nearer.
And friends, with that prayer that God would draw us near, we have his promise that he has drawn us near, that we who were far away have through the blood of the cross been back near to God. And as forgiven people, now we are commissioned people. And today we are going to commission those who will be leading our youth. And I invite us to do that together in a litany. It's in your bulletins. So will be on the screen. Let's do this together. <coughs> Friends, our God is a covenant God. He gives his promises to us and to our children. We have the joyful responsibility of teaching our children his word and his way. At baptism, we all promise to help nurture the children of this church in the true faith. And we want to rededicate ourselves to this task as we begin a new season of church education. So with that, I'd like to invite all who are going to teach Sunday school or catechism, who are teaching our girls ministry gyms or the boys ministry cadets, all youth leaders, all children and worship leaders and helpers, anyone who's involved to please stand at this time. You can see it takes a lot of people to serve our youth. Friends, we are grateful to God that each of you is willing to serve our Covenant Youth in Bethel's education program. We acknowledge the call of Christ in your life. We affirm your gifts for this calling, and we encourage you in your service. Friends, do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, and do you rely on him to equip you for your work, and do you commit yourselves to prayerfully teach and model the truth of God's word? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for each member of the education staff of this church. Give them wisdom to make the most of every opportunity, to teach and to model their faith this year. By your spirit, fill them with love, patience, boldness, and joy in their work. Use them to be a blessing in the lives of those they serve. Amen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now to join your teachers, I'd like to invite all the children, young adults, uh, cadets, gems, young peoples that will be receiving educations here to stand as well as we ask you a charge. So if you're, a, please stand, young people and children. You can see a lot of charges that God has given us. Now this charge to you. Children and young people, God calls you to respect and obey the teachers and leaders who work with you this year. Will you pray for them and cooperate with them so that this can be a year of blessing and spiritual growth for all of us? Children and young people, what is your answer? We will, God helping us. Now, congregation, let us say, don't let anyone look down at you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Closing this with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for each of our covenant children and youth. We ask your spirit to work in their hearts and minds so that they may know and love the truth. Help us to live together in love and unity as the family of God. May we and all your people grow in maturity in our faith and in the image of the one who loves us. Amen. Friends, you may be seated, and our song of dedication speaks of the love that we will show and receive Jesus loves me.
Thank you, choir. And as we hear about that Bible who tells us of Jesus' love, we turn together in Scripture now, and I invite you to turn with me in the book of Genesis, chapter 13 today, the 18 verses of chapter 13. It's page 11 in your pew Bibles at the very beginning of of your Bible. If you have your own Bible, you're welcome to turn to it as well, Genesis chapter 13. If you're a guest with us this fall, we're walking through in sequence a number of chapters in the book of Genesis following the life of one man and woman, Abram and Sarai. And we're trying to walk with uh, this couple because in their life we see God's school of faith and we pray that as we journey with them, we will also sit in the classroom of God's grace. We began that journey in chapter 12 when we had God call Abraham and Abraham took a bold step of faith, leaping out from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the unfamiliar. But then last week we saw that once in the promised land, his journey continued not in triumph but with a stumble. That rather than receiving what he would perceive as the blessing of God, his call led him into famine. And rather than responding in faith, he responded in Egypt in fear. Now that journey continues and we pick up the journey where we left off, walking with this man of faith. And as we do that, would you pray with me? Gracious God, everyone in this place and everyone hearing these words are on a journey. For some of us, this journey has gone on for many years and decades and maybe we feel tired and lost. Others of us are just beginning the journey or maybe even considering whether we want to go on a journey of faith. We are still contemplating that first step. Father, some of us are so weary. We pray that today by your word you would help us hear the story of Jesus and his love that your Holy Spirit would use your living word to shine your light upon our path and to guide us in your ways. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Genesis 13. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called in the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for the possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are, And look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, 
Walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want to begin with something that I read this week that I found remarkable. I read that every day, every single day, each one of us here makes about 10,000 decisions. That every 24 hours, we are faced with 10,000 choices that we need to make. Now, if hearing that number seems a little fantastical, or maybe like me, or a little cynical about statistics, it seems too neat and tidy. It seems like, did someone really count that? And, and by the way, isn't there a range? I mean, this morning, I was just watching my wife trying to pick out which outfit to do and she put her hair up or down, what shade of makeup, and I just rolled out of bed and my only decision was, do I kick the cat or whack him, right? (laughs) So maybe there's a range, but I think whatever that number is, we can agree that we all make a lot of decisions. And I think we can also agree that little by little, those decisions make us. That those big decisions like where we go to college or what career we choose or who we marry, if we marry, those major decisions in fundamental ways shape how our lives go, but also it's those daily small decisions. Do I do my homework or don't I? Do I say the uncomfortable truth or do I tell a more comfortable white lie? Those little decisions also shape who we become. Today I'm not going to look at what decisions we make, but of those 10,000, I want us to ask the question, Why do we make the decisions that we do? The deep question, why do we decide each day as we do? And we're going to answer that question looking in Genesis 13, which is a story of two men faced with a decision. And the result of that decision is a very huge consequence for them and for all their descendants. And we're going to look today that the difference in those decisions was the reasons that lay behind them. And so we look at the life of Abraham again. What we see in chapter 13 is Abram has just returned from his ill-gotten adventure in Egypt. Remember, he left Egypt silent under the reproach of Pharaoh, but here we see he has now come back to where he started. In verse 10 of chapter 12, notice he went down to Egypt, and now the very first verse of 13, Abram goes up from Egypt. That links these two stories geographically, but there's another link in vocabulary. In chapter 12, verse 10, we're told that there was a severe famine. The Hebrew for that word severe is the word uh, kaved. In the beginning of 13, verse 2, we read that he was very wealthy. That's actually in Hebrew the same word. He was kaved. He was heavy with wealth. What scholars say is the author of Genesis is pointing us that these two stories, Abraham's success in Canaan and before that his failure in Egypt, must be read together to be understood that the author is showing us that these stories reveal that Abram is like us. He is a person of great faith, but also of great fear and doubt. And maybe he's showing us here that men of faith and women of faith aren't born, they are formed by God's work in their lives. And that's hopeful for us. So Abram returns to the promised land, but then he also returns, he retraces his steps, and he goes to where this started. Notice in verses 3 and 4. He goes from place to place, He's kind of doing a little bit of church hopping, but then he arrives back at Bethel. And he's like, oh yeah, that's where I want to be. So he arrives back at Bethel, and there he is returned to where he first built his tent and he first built an altar. And there we read, he calls in the name of the Lord. And actually at the very end of this passage, he again builds an altar in Hebron. So this text is framed in worship. There is an aroma of worship that permeates the story. But in the midst of that, there is also a sense of foreboding. Because we see that there is someone with Abram. He wasn't present in Egypt. He was present, but he was silent. But here we read that there's a a person named Lot who is traveling with Abram. Now, if you read chapter 11, you'll know that Lot is Abram's nephew. Abram had two brothers. His youngest brother died while still in Ur before God called. And Abram has taken his dead brother's son and he's raised him as a nephew. His nephew has raised him as a son. Now, this is actually the first story of three that we'll read in Genesis where Abram is rescuing or graciously helping his nephew. But what's interesting here is that with his nephew, there is now a problem. The very next verse. But the land could not support them while they stayed together because their possessions were so great. Now, there's an irony here. 
In chapter 12, when he had just called the name of the Lord, that worship was met by the challenge of a famine. Now he's just called in the name of the Lord, and that worship is met with the challenge of a family dispute. The first one was out of scarcity. This one is out of abundance. The other one, because there was too little, now there is too much. And so we read that there is quarreling. Now, if you want to just take a step back, you'll see that God is gracious, but there are consequences. This is parenthetical to our choices. In chapter 12, remember, he lies to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh responds by taking his wife and then lavishing gifts on Abram. Verse 16 of chapter 12, notice those gifts. Abraham was given sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, which if you've gone through fifth grade biology, that makes baby donkeys. Manservants, maidservants, and camels. And so now there's too many livestock. Where did that come from? It's a consequence of his lie. And if you know the story, there's also an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar who will cause some other problems in the family later on. So Abram is back in his homeland where he started, but now there is this problem and it's created a feud and we read that there is quarreling between the party of Abram and the party of Lot. And this might be a culturally hard thing for us to understand. I'm sure for many of us, we can't even imagine that in the same family, you would have people who would actually argue about farmland. Can you believe that in Sioux County, that people would do that? Family people arguing about farmland? No. But they did back then. So Abram and Lot, through their herdsmen, are vying for power. And as they're quarreling, they are faced with a choice. And this is the choice. Do we continue in quarreling or do we do something else? And if we do, one of these 10,000 choices they made that day, what do we do? Abram frames that choice by calling for peace. And so he says, let's not quarrel between us. We are brothers, which is a gracious thing for an uncle to say to a nephew. But then he goes on from that and he presents his nephew with one of those fundamental choices of life. He says to him, look, the whole land's before you. You can go to the right or the left. Wherever you go, I'll take the remainder. You pick first. That's the choice presented to Lot, one of the 10,000 he made on that momentous day. And what does Lot choose? Well, he does very carefully. We read in the very next verse, verse 10, that Lot looked up and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered. And there's a description. It's like the Garden of God. It's like Eden. It's like heaven itself. It's like Egypt where they've just come from, where there's no famine. He surveys that land and he makes his choice. And I want us to see what this choice was. It was a very simple choice. If you look at a picture here, the top that Cinnamania limestone, very rolling, hilly, dry, dependent on rain, very thin topsoil. That's Bethel. It's a picture of Bethel. Below that is a picture of the Jordan Valley. Rich soil, well watered, relatively flat, good agricultural land. So he's standing at Bethel on this high mountain, about 2,886 feet. He's looking down into this valley, <coughs> and he's choosing do I do A or do I do B? Which would you choose? This is a simple choice. It's like saying, if you want to farm, do you want to farm in Iowa or do you want to farm in the Badlands? This is the sort of choice like, do you want to win the lottery or do you want to be audited in your taxes? Do you want to have a sweet tooth satisfied or do you want to have your tooth extracted? The sort of obvious things. Do you want a tractor that works or do you want something else? <laughs> this is an obvious choice. And that's exactly what Lot decides, verse 11. And so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan. And I want us to reflect on that a little bit. Can we see how selfish this choice was, even if it's obvious? I mean, have you ever been to like a wedding reception and there's cake, but everyone's been in front of you, so just two pieces left and you're there with your friend and there's one of those big middle pieces left? And there's like one of those tiny corner pieces left, like an inch of cake and a whole bunch of disgusting frosting. And your friend's in front of you and he takes the big middle piece and he leaves you the little corner's frosting edge. Don't you get a little angry? Lot takes the best for himself and he leaves the worst for his uncle. But I don't want you just to see the selfishness of it. I want you to see with the narrator the foolishness of it. Because in three different ways, the narrator is showing us that this actually wasn't a wise choice. The first way he shows that is the way he contrasts this plain. Look what he says. It's well watered. 
But then he adds parenthetically, oh, that was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. What he's saying is it looks well watered, but one day it will be burned with fire. That it looks like heaven, the garden of God, but actually it is more like hell. Lot has chosen poorly. The second clue that he's done poorly is because we're told that he headed east to get to his land. Now, if you've read Genesis, you'll know that that's not a good direction to go. In Genesis chapter 3, God expels Adam and Eve from the garden to the east, and so he puts a guard in the east so they can't come back. In Genesis chapter 4, after Cain murders his brother Abel, he is exiled, and where is he exiled? Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived east of Eden. East is where you go in judgment. And that's where Lot goes. And the third clue that he's chosen poorly is who lives in the land he's chosen. Notice he pitches his tent near Sodom, but then we're told that Sodom, the men of Sodom were wicked and very, sinning very greatly against the Lord. He has chosen a place with good land, but bad people. He has chosen poorly. And as we read the story, we're going to see that this choice has consequences. In the very next chapter, he will escape by the skin of his teeth. And then in chapter 18 and 19, we'll see Lot will escape from his wonderful land with nothing but the clothes on his back, and he will lose his wife in the process, and he will be huddled in a cave with his two daughters. That is the consequence of one of these 10,000 choices. He chose the obvious, but he chose poorly. And the question is, why? That's our question. Why did he choose what he did? And the narrator tells us, Lot chose because of what he saw. Notice again verse 10. Lot decided, he looked up, and that's, he looked up longingly, he looked up carefully, he surveyed meticulously, that's behind that word, and he saw the plain was well watered. He is deciding by sight. He is making his choice by what his retinas see. Whatever data enter through this organ is whatever he decides based on. And the problem with deciding by sight is you will always decide in a mentality of scarcity because your retinas will only let in so much data. And if that's what you base your decision on, it will be based on a limited reality. And if you base a choice out of scarcity, you will do it also out of selfishness. And that's what Lot does. He sees, he looks what seems like a good place, what seems like a bad place, and selfishly he picks the best for himself and the result is catastrophic. And the problem was the why, choosing based on sight. Now, if that's what we're talking about here, this why question this morning, then maybe this choice that Lot make, although it's different than our choices each day, our 10,000, maybe the why behind it is very similar to us. Because I ask you and the questions and the choices you will make this week, why do you decide what you decide? One of the answers, of course, is sometimes we make choices just out of stupidity saw this little graphic on Facebook, I thought it was telling, everything happens for a reason, but sometimes that reason is that you're stupid and make bad decisions. I don't recommend actually pasting that on a friend's wall, but it's capturing something. It's capturing like this man you might have seen this week's Time magazine, a man who's 33 years old from Connecticut who was caught speeding 112 miles an hour on Interstate 89 in Vermont cop asked what he was doing, he was actually going to pay a speeding ticket in the Vermont court. (laughs) Stupid decision. Sometimes that's what we do. That's behind, that's the why. But I think behind that stupidity is exactly what Lot is doing. That we make our decisions so enamored with the pleasure of the thing we're looking at that we're blinded to the danger. Maybe you're so enamored with the salary that a career will offer, you are blinded to the ethical compromise you will have to make to succeed or to the cost this will take to your family. So often I see young people so enamored by the beauty of someone they want to date that they are blinded to that person's lack of faith or lack of gentleness. So often our choices are actually, like Lot's, very subtly blinded to danger. He doesn't move to Sodom, he just moves his tents near it. And so often we make decisions And we don't actually go right to the danger. We just do a couple clicks and we get a little bit of a rush, but we don't know those choices are making us into a kind of person we don't want to be. And often when we act out of this blindness, we act out of scarcity and we act selfishly. Growing up as a boy, there was a farm near us, two brothers. The father died 
And these two brothers, surprise, surprise, couldn't agree on what you'd do with the agricultural land. One of them got the farm. The other one sued. They spent over $100,000 in lawyer bills. As the farmer who had the land was combining his corn, somehow a greater blade got placed right in the middle of the, the, the row of corn and destroyed the common. I don't know how that happened. Whenever they would drive by in the small road in northern Michigan, they wouldn't wave at each other. They wouldn't go to family dinners together. They lost their family. They made that choice because they decided to act out of what they could see and not out of something deeper. I think that's our issue today. Why do we make our choices? And if we're making them based on sight, out of a sense of scarcity and out of a selfishness, what's going to be best for me? What am I going to get out of this? How am I going to maximize my portfolio? Then we, like Lot, are just destined to make choices that are foolish and that are destructive. And the narrator wants us to see that because he lifts up Lot as a foil to Abram. He wants us to see this different way of deciding to highlight the new way that God is showing to Abram of living in this world. Remember, these stories are linked. Last time, Abram decided out of sight, leaning on his own devices, trying to, through lying and deceit, get what he needed. Now, Abram, under the rekindled altar at Bethel, to the aroma of worship, is opened by God to a new way of living life. And so Abram, if you think about it, had every right to do what he wanted. He is the patriarch. He is the uncle. He is the older one. He is the one who received the call to the land. He is the one who's been given the promise to the land. And yet he is able not to claim his right, but to relinquish it. He is able not to demand self-preferential treatment, but to engage in self-detrimental behavior. He is able to put his family over a greater, greater fortune. He is able to hold on to the promise of God rather than pursuing greater prosperity. And the question is, why? And the answer is that Abram is acting not out of sight by the land that he could see, because he could see the valley was just as green as Lot could. He is not acting by sight. He is acting out of faith. He is acting out of an awareness that God rules this world, That the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of scarcity. What you see is all you get. It's a kingdom of abundance. That God holds in his hands the cattle on a thousand hills. That the blessings that he have can flow as far as the curse is found. And out of abundance, he reacts not in selfishness, but in selflessness, in generosity. And so on the hills near Bethel, Abram lives out the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. He chooses peace over prosperity. Do not worry about tomorrow when you're heading towards a city whose architect and builder is God. Who cares where you pinch your tent? Abram doesn't. Golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. He chooses the smaller piece of cake because he knows that a feast and a banquet is coming. And if that's how the people of God are to decide, then that has implications for you and I. Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke says this, Christians are to relinquish their rights in order to enrich others, trusting God's promises to provide. Abraham, secure in God, can give up his land. When we are secure in Christ, we do not have to grasp greedily for possessions. What he's saying is, Abraham knew the promise which allowed him to be generous. And friends, we know an even deeper promise, that in Christ all things are ours, 1 Corinthians 3. That in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And that if you really believe that, then those 10,000 decisions you face every day can be made not out of scarcity, but out of the abundance of God's goodness. Can be not made in selfishness, what's best for me, but can be made generously. What will bless those God's placed around me? It's a different way to live. A different way to decide. And I want us to see in closing When Abram lives this way, what happens? He begins to live, unlike Egypt, these linked stories. Now he begins to live not by sight, but by faith, out of the promise of God. And what does God do? He redoubles the promise. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted, lift up your eyes. That's the same phrase that Lot had done. But Lot had looked, Abraham is shown. Lot had tried to take, Abraham is given. 
Lot had sought all these things and lost the kingdom. Abraham has sought first the kingdom and all these things are given him as well. And God increases the promise. In chapter 12, he said, this land I'll give. Now he says, all the land I'll give forever. He's increased it in scope and in length. Before he said, you'll be a great nation. Now he says, your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. An unfathomably great nation. God responds to Abram's obedience to the promise by clarifying that promise. He says, walk around the land. Act like you own it. Walk around like you own the place because wherever you step, I am going to give that to you. Walk in faith. So today, we will be faced with 10,000 decisions and you will be tomorrow as well. But in the grace of God, what we see today is that we are able to make those decisions out of the abundance of God's promise to us, out of the assurance that the future is in his hands and we can walk by faith, leaning on his grace 10,000 times a day. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is hard in this world to trust and to obey you. And we confess how often in the decisions we make each day, those big momentous ones, but also the small ones that together make up our lives. So often we act out of fear, we act out of worry, anxiety. We act selfishly. We believe that this world is so small and limited and we need to claw for what we can get. But we thank you for your work in Abram's life, for lifting his eyes not to take but to see you the giver, to live out of your promise for him. And we thank you for the peacemaking and the generosity and the selflessness, the image of Christ who emptied himself became nothing. And we thank you for this father in the faith and your work in his life for you are doing that work in ours. Father, may we follow you this week in joy for we pray in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen. Our song of response is that old hymn, when we walk with the Lord, trust and obey. Let's stand to sing at Psalter Hymnal. Number 548 will sing stanza one through three. be seated and we come to the God we trust in prayer. As we do, one prayer request I received this morning, Joyce Heinen, yesterday evening fell and broke her collarbone. She'll be going in tomorrow for a consultation. 
want to pray for patience for her, for removal of pain, and for a healing for her body. With that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this journey that we are all on, whether we are contemplating that first step or have just by grace taken it, whether we have journeyed long and our journey has been pleasant or whether we have journeyed long and it has been difficult and we are worn. Lord, we thank you that for each of us on this journey, you walk beside us. Father, that you, through Christ, our Emmanuel, that you are God with us. And so, Father, we trust and obey, not out of the strength of our commitment to you, but out of the strength of your commitment to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Lot and Abram. How Lot could act out of a claiming and a clinging to the paradise he wanted, where you enabled Abraham to live out of the promise you've given. Father, we pray that this week, by your spirit, each day in the big and small ways, you would move us to this trust and this kind of a life. Gracious God, as a congregation, we thank you for the gifts you've given us. This morning, we're so thankful for the children and young people that you've given us to disciple, for the promises that you made to them at baptism, that you made through us to them. Father, we pray today that you would empower each teacher, each volunteer, each cadet counselor, gems counselor, each children and worship leader, each helper. Emily Insminger, she leads our youth program and the youth leaders as well. Lord, every single person involved in discipleship that you would to this day pour out your spirit that they could respond with joy to this call. Father, we pray that this would be a year of our children growing in you, claiming you as Lord and Savior, being so shaped that whatever calling you place in their lives, wherever in the world they end up, they would walk in faith. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the gift of music. We're so thankful for the Christian schools and even the public schools and the home schools where our children can learn about you, but we're so thankful that in this day, you also allow us to name your name in praise. Lord, thank you for the Dort Concert Choir. Thank you for the way that they have blessed us and for the gifts you've given and the way you're using those gifts to build your body. Heavenly Father, we also thank you for the missionaries who go out from this church. We thank you for the update this week from Josh and Joni in Nicaragua. May you continue now in this new season as a family for them to watch over them, to give them strength, to provide for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of the churches around this community and we pray today for Hope Lutheran Church and Pastor Katie Russell May you bless this community in their walk with you. Give them hearts that are generous to the hurting and to the outcast. Lord, may we with them serve this community in this world. We also pray this day for Cornerstone Prison Church and for their weekend fellowship this coming weekend. We pray that you will bless each of those inmates in the South Dakota Penitentiary, that you would bless those who worship with them. Father, we thank you that even where the world builds boxes and puts up iron bars, that in Christ we are one body. Heavenly Father, we feel that oneness also with a world that's hurting. And so we stand with Christians in Syria, some who are fleeing for their lives to Europe and other places. We pray that you would move our hearts to be a welcoming community. And even now, as we are exploring options for settling refugees in Sioux Center as a possibility, we pray that you would make those doors clearly yours, that you would open and close the right ones. Father, that we would respond with your compassion out of the generosity of those who live in the promise. Heavenly Father, we lay before you the needs of this congregation. We thank you with Beth Kudum for a successful pacemaker placement on Monday and for her continued healing and strength this past week. We thank you with Dick Hoagland for her continued recovery from a surgery for a broken hip and for opening a door to Sioux Center for him to now begin rehabilitation. Heavenly Father, we do, in the midst of Thanksgiving, also pray for your blessing on Joyce Heinen. This morning, surround her, give her patience, give her peace. Remove pain, give clarity tomorrow to the doctors. Father, may you be the one who heals and mends this bone. Father, continue to bless Stan Hawk and others recovering from recent surgeries. Continue to watch over Gene Vonk and his journey with cancer. Continue to watch over each of our loved ones walking this journey of cancer. May you be our healer. Heavenly Father, we lay before you those on processes of adoption. May you open the right door in your time. We lay before you those of us who struggle with mental illness and anxiety depression. Heavenly Father, may you in this week be our light and our rock. Father, we pray for those of us who are seeking your call and your leading on our lives. We pray this day that you once again would give us the ability to walk in the abundance of your kingdom, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and to know that all these things will be given us as well. Father, bless our marriages. Bless those of us who are single. May you be our friend and confidant, and may this body of Christ be home for all of us, no matter what we bring to this place. 
Heavenly Father, hear our prayers. Receive now our gifts and our offerings. Use them to build your kingdom. For we offer them in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we give our offerings, the choir will sing the song, The Deer's Cry. We have lyrics for the next two songs in your bulletins, but they're actually reversed. And so the words to this song are printed after the closing song if you want to follow along as they sing. As they sing, we'll give our offerings first for the ministries of this church and second for Christian education.
Friends, would you stand for our closing hymn, our hymn of dedication? Of all those 10,000 choices we will make in any given day, the most vital choice that's presented to each of us in grace is that choice to decide to follow Jesus. And our closing hymn is, I have decided to follow Jesus. If you're just beginning this journey, may this even be a step for you in faith. Let's sing together. the service there's cookies and punch and we invite you to all stay in fellowship together and if you'd like something more than cookies encourage your neighbors or take the survey of hopefully donut holes in a coming week as you go out to serve this God to follow him in faith we go with God's blessing and after that parting blessing I'm going to invite you to be seated and the choir will end this service singing together I will be a child of peace but first this blessing friends may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope as you trust in him. Amen. You may be seated.